Thank you so much. And lovely to meet you. Thank you, pleasure. Okay. Oh, no, we're okay, we're okay. Okay, so thank you so much too, of course, Sir Tim and Juan Bennett. I think all of us found that a fantastic and fascinating discussion. Um, please, now we're going to go to Ramesh Ramados, who's co-chair of the IEEE Blockchain Technical Community, um, who's going to lead our next panel. And the theme is, could decentralized infrastructures supercharge all that the metaverse can offer? Over to Ramesh. <laughs> Yes, please, please sit there. All the chairs in place. Okay, panelists, enjoy. I think I'll sit on this one. Yeah, you guys sit there. That's the first one. Ah, you want me to see the front here? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Just <laughs> <laughs> go down. Yeah. Right here, after you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. And the mic on? When do we start? Can we start? I think we can start now. The countdown yeah, has started. Sorry. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, well, welcome everyone. So, today uh, we have a great panel. Uh, it's going to be on how decentralized infrastructures, uh, like we call it blockchain, can enable metaverse. Um, actually, I already prepared the question, so not to surprise these guys. So I'll do the opening in terms of why we're doing this panel. So Metaverse is, uh, I'm sure you want talked about this, is considered to be the next you know, generation of the internet. And uh, it's still evolving. If you ask these guys, you'll hear different things. Uh, and then, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we were at CES la at Las Vegas a couple a week ago, and they had their first Metaverse lounge. If you walk through it, you know, it's, it's like Metaverse is like this AR, VR headset, there's, you know, gaming guys, there's like, you know, 5G, there's, you know, a blockchain, AI, digital twins, all of these things, right? It's integration of all of these different technologies. But today, we're going to look at the angle, from the angle of how blockchain can enable building Metaverses, and that's the focus. And I will, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you making it here on time, especially Sebastian, you. <laughs> You made us nervous. Uh, so now let's do a quick intro. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I chair the IEEE Blockchain Initiative. I think you want to talk about IEEE. IEEE has many areas of focus. I lead the blockchain globally. And uh, let's each one of us do a quick intro. Uh, I said one minute each, but let's make it 30 seconds because time is running out. So 30 seconds each, please. Intro. Omar, please. Hi, so first off, uh, thank you to Ramesh and Yuan and IEEE for having me on the panel. It's a pleasure to be here and to Filecoin for hosting us. Um, my name is Omar el -Assar. I'm the Global Head of Ecosystem Growth and Business Development at Parity Technologies, the company behind Polkadot. Um, for those of you who don't know, Polkadot is the technology token and community uh, powering the movement for a better web. Um, as a layer zero protocol, uh, Polkadot enables builders to develop products and services across the entire stack, uh, ent the entire Web3 technology stack from specialized blockchains all the way to decentralized applications um, and cross-chain smart contracts, um, all within a highly interoperable and secure environment. You. So for those who just arrived, so my name is Yu Yuan. I'm the president of the IEEE Standards Association. So we develop uh, over thousands of uh, standards, including like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Ethernet. Those are popular ones. Thank you. Sebastian. Hi, I'm Sebastian Borger. I'm the COO and co-founder at the Sandbox, as well as the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance, which uh, some of you are member of. Um, Sandbox is essentially a decentralized gaming virtual world where essentially anyone can become a creator and truly own the content they build, they create, whether it's like 3D asset or game experiences. They can only use it anywhere they want, monetize it the way they want. And we've been growing, quite frankly, uh, up to 4.3 million users already engaged with the wallet, uh, more than 400 brands on our platform and 
over 23,000 people who own virtual land to develop the experience of in the metaverse. So, Dietrich. Hi, everybody. My name is Dietrich Ayala. I'm the IPFS ecosystem lead for browsers and platforms at Protocol Labs. I work on bringing the interplanetary file system to browsers, mobile devices, and even satellites, as you may have heard this morning from the press release from Filecoin Foundation. Uh, IPFS is a protocol that backs most of the NFTs today, and that's probably what it's best known for. Thank you. So by the way, when we put this panel together, we had a female speaker to cover about policy. You know, they don't, they're not here. So please, you know, forgive us. The other two panels we took care of, you know, we have balanced uh, gender ratio, right? So next year, we'll make sure we cover that. This year, please excuse us. Let's move on. So very quick, you know, we have only 20 minutes here. So what is your definition of metaverse? So when you answer the following questions, people can understand like from which angle you're looking at it, right? Let's, what's your definition of metaverse? Yeah, so I think most people think of uh, gaming and virtual experiences when they think of metaverse and rightly so. Um, you know, to me, metaverse are, metaverses are about, um, you know, a new class of highly social and immersive experiences which are underpinned by new digitally native um, co human uh, collaborations and interactions, right? So while virtual spaces are a big part of it because they're gonna bring people from all over the world to interact in real time in the same place, I think the conversation also needs to include some of these uh, core Web3 primitives, mm. such as um, you know, digital ownership, decentralized identity, and privacy, because those are really crucial to the experience. Yeah. You, I know you can talk for 19 hours, but please. <laughs> okay, like. 30 minutes, okay. Yeah, so in my opening remarks, I try to be more inclusive. But myself, I have been working in the metaverse area for over two decades, although I didn't call that metaverse. So to me, I think, uh, firstly, I, metaverse is uh, an experience built upon digital technologies. Uh, that is about uh, the outside world is perceived by the users as a digital universe, which could be a different universe, which is VR, or a digital extension of our country universe, which is AR or MR, or a digital counterpart or copy of our country universe, which is digital twin. These are two, three major categories of metaverse, in my humble opinion. Now, you're building um, a metaverse. So we're building sandbox. a part of the open metaverse. Uh, like we really see the metaverse as this myriad of virtual worlds and destination where users can access with an avatar, a 3D character that's become their digital identity. And unlike what we've seen before with virtual worlds or gaming platforms, which are all of like centralized, closed wall gardens, siloed from each other, the metaverse is this idea that you can move from one other with your avatar, take all your digital assets, your belonging, your wearable, your land, your house, mm. your game item, and use them across any of those virtual worlds as you want. And really, the metaverse is not tied to a single device or a single platform. It could be mobile, web, yeah. AR, VR, desktop. Mm -hmm. Any technology underlying is uh, making it accessible as long as you have this freedom of ownership and utility on multiple places. Dietrich. Uh, I work on core protocols that underlie these systems. And I think the characteristics of the metaverse, which I think is the next generation of the internet we all use today is going to be different in a few ways. First is the ownership aspect of it, which is a key part of your experiences online that we don't have today, mentioned by these guys already. The second is that portability, the ability to move between systems frictionlessly. And for that to work, both of those, you have to have trust. And how do we trust right now what we see, what we experience on the regular web? We need to have better ways of trusting and feeling safe in spaces that are going to inhabit every physical space that we enter with strangers or even with friends. And so at the protocol level, what a metaverse means is that identity, portability, and trust. OK, so I think it kind of leads to the next question I had was like, how can you know, blockchain or decentralized infrastructures, computing, storage, uh, even communication protocols uh, enable building of metaverses like let's keep it really short i think you kind of started answering you know, from that angle like you can start with you know for example polka you have several metaverse projects and yeah i mean i think it, we can all agree that the decentralized protocols and open infrastructures are a key piece of the puzzle if we want to accomplish what we've just been discussing um 
and, and I think some of the stuff that Protocol Labs is doing with um, Filecoin and IPFS is, is definitely a, a core part of that. What gets me really excited is the new trend that we're seeing in which metaverse projects actually want to build their own specialized blockchains as opposed to building dApps on top of existing L1s. And you know, beyond the technological benefits of doing that, um, really what that enables is for these um, new projects to plug into other interoperable blockchains, especially if you build it within um, you know, a secure and interoperable ecosystem like Polkadot, to benefit from some of the other core services and, uh, and, and benefits. So um, you know, let's say Sebastian wanted to move um, the sandbox over to a new L1, he'd really be able to take advantage of decentralized identity, which is being built by Kilt Protocol on Polkadot, or Manta Network, which is building a privacy network, which it turns out is actually an extremely difficult computer science problem to solve. Um, and so the, the design principle there is that teams should focus on building what they're specialized at, mm. and therefore that promotes innovation. So mm -hmm. to, to bring that home, I think choosing the right infrastructure um, will really have a massive impact on how rich the metaverse experience can, can be. There's the technology aspect of it, the infrastructure, and there's also the tokenomics part of it, correct? This, you know, tokenization, the, reward tokens, NFTs, and yes, perhaps... Yes, there is uh, infrastructure, the content, the tools, and indeed, like, the economy layer. I think the, the part I'd like to highlight is, so far, only blockchain as a technology has provided the trust and the transparency so that multiple uh, entities could develop the content and virtual worlds and exchange data without one being accused of like editing the user content, etc., which we've seen happen before, or have to rely on like centralized API to like exchange data, but to which point can you trust the data you receive mm -hmm. from an API or like how it keeps being updated by the original developer and force maintenance. Those are some of the challenges that blockchain solve, but there's more challenges, and that's why recently, last year, there's been two major uh, organization that came up from like uh, industry from the one first one has been the metaverse standard forum which uh, like has been joined mostly by web 2 centralized company initially adobe uh, microsoft nvidia roblox fortnite epic and a few other to focus on like portability of file formats already like how we're going to represent the contents across different worlds uh, for and there's more topic in working groups. Now I think they have over 1,000 members, including web free companies, so it's grown. The second has been the Open Metaverse Alliance, which went a bit further because it's already built from the ground up around web free technology. So we've been looking at how do we bring like reputation when like you bring your avatar, your identity across one or another. It's not just like the 3D character you want to bring, but all your history, your skills, your progression, your achievements, etc. We've also been looking at portaling in certain web uh, working group. How do you move from one world to another seamlessly and represent different lands from each of uh, those different platform and devices? And this is frankly hard topic to tackle while at the same time we're entrepreneur building our own product and growing our audience and having to drive revenue or raise funds, etc. So a lot of challenges. Okay. Yeah. Let's I, see if you have any yeah, comments. If I may add, I would say, next. Uh, well, blockchain and decentralization, I love them. So I actually started IEEE's first uh, blockchain standards committee back in 2018. But I wanted to point out that uh, blockchain or decentralization, they are not purposes, they are means. So they are good things that are, uh, I would say, very helpful, but uh, to me, I think uh, they are still optional to the metaverse. So there are centralized ways to do all kinds of things. So decentralization, I love it but we need to uh, focus on use cases. What kind of real value we can create for our customers, for users. I think that's, that's the ultimate uh, goal we need to do. So uh, I think that is also a gap that the existing organizations like uh, uh, MSF and uh, OMA3, probably the, they are not uh, missing, so, so they are missing. So we are uh, establishing the metaverse acceleration and the sustainability uh, association to try to fill that gap. Do you have anything to share or move to the next Yeah, question? I, mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really good point that we need to focus on real use cases and things that have real value to end users. And one of the challenges that we just heard about in the last session is like trust in online platforms is pretty low right now. And for a metaverse to be exciting and engaging and for it to be a default part of our lives online, end users have to have more control over those experiences. 
And I think only uh -huh. decentralized technologies can provide that control by end users. Okay, now let's talk about the, you know, the aspect of, uh, there is these you know, centralized metaverse being built by big companies, you know, like Meta, Microsoft, and so on. And you know, people label them as centralized closed metaverses. And then, and then we have you know, like guys like you know, Sandbox and uh, Decentraland, they're building you know, on blockchains, and uh, they call them like open uh, metaverses, right? What are your views? Like, if you talk to you know these folks, they're like talking about tokens and NFTs, and if you talk to the big guys, they're talking about the headsets and software and all this, you know. So, uh, what is your view on these two ecosystems? Uh, you know, the two, I guess you can say, two different approaches to realizing metaverse. Like, let's maybe you, you can start you. you yeah. Are, so I would say I always here. try to be more inclusive. So uh, I won't say, I like this decentralization again, but uh, I don't say decentralization, decentralized metaverse uh, uh, will rule the world. I don't say that. So I think, in my opinion, centralized metaverses and the decentralized metaverses are going to coexist maybe forever. Uh, if we say all the metaverses have to be decentralized, that's another kind of totally them. I don't say that. Okay. So they have different values. They have different ecosystems. OK. Uh I, I like to hide, like, like we don't talk about NFT on Twitter all the time. We focus okay. on like, user experience, content, what makes uh, like the whole experience fun and people to br come back. And so that could be like a mainstream destination. But we also talk about value proposition and how like focusing on the creator economy, the people who spend their time to mm. build those experience and maybe will like bring through that new communities, new users, I feel those people deserve to receive most of the value uh, like from that dedication and passion and time they put in. And that's, uh, if they choose to do that on Web2 centralized uh, products, I feel like that we're, we're kind of failing to have given like a, a, an end to a mean from the use of blockchain perspective. So. Uh, what blockchain is yours built on? Uh, we are built on Ethereum and Polygon blockchain. Omar made an offer. <laughs> well, well, I think like okay. what, was, so, what Omar uh, was so saying hit. is interesting. I think at some point, through decentralization, it's not even Sandbox who should decide. Yeah. It should be yeah. the community yeah. that takes the content and over. build the protocols and do that, all of that. So that will come. Any yeah. comments, Dietrich? Well, I, I think that the way that the centralized experiences and decentralized experiences live together is, is going to be really similar to how HTTP in the web browser for the last 30 years allowed me to go from a centralized platform to a small independent blog or zine in just a click of a link. And for the metaverse to succeed, you have to have that same type of very low friction interaction and interoperable standards built into it. If you don't have those two things together and the ability for users to switch easily between the systems, it's going to be a really tough experience for you. Okay, so it's glad well, the, the panel is going the way I planned it. Uh, let's. Uh, <laughs> the next topic is uh, you know interoperability. Now you guys talked about like this you know these open uh, closed centralized metaverses and you have these open uh, blockchain based metaverses and then let's talk about interoperability. How are they going to work together? Like uh, you know in the blockchain space we have like Polkadot and to be fair you know Cosmos and uh, the projects they try to address interoperability, the technical level uh, for blockchains, but how do we address that when it comes to metaverses? Uh, first of all, we have two different approaches, right? And then, uh, well, let, let's hear from you guys. Like, uh, I don't know, if Polka, based on your experience, I mean, do you see that uh, helping in terms of the metaverse project? Yeah, I mean, look, Polkadot was, was yeah. built with interoperability in mind. In blockchain interoperability in mind. And so, um, you know, it's definitely fit for purpose to enable interactive, interoperable metaverses if we are serious about building metaverses that can um, allow users to, again, own their data, own their experiences, own their contacts, and be able to take them with them, move across to other metaverses, or trade and interact across metaverses. Interoperability needs to be there. There needs to be a standard. Um, obviously, with Polkadot, interoperability through XCM, which is our, our cross-chain messaging layer, is built at the protocol level, level. It is an advanced way of doing that. 
And um, we think that, that, that you know, folks and teams that are really serious about interoperability um, will see that and flock to that. Uh, I'm sure all of you okay, have. Okay, I do yeah. that, <laughs> So uh, interoperability uh, should be addressed at different levels. Uh, my observation is that currently the, the centralized community, they are focusing on interoperable, interchangeable file formats, graphics formats, things like that. And the decentralized community is focusing on uh, interchangeable uh, inter uh, like, uh, assets, if I can put that way, assets. But to me, I think, uh, we, again, we still need to, well, technologies and the standards are not enough. We still need to look into use cases, uh, actual use cases. For example, uh, I think it's a good thing to allow users to bring one virtual asset to, from one virtual world to another. But does that, does that really make sense if you allow one user to bring a battleship from, let's say, the, war, uh, the world of warships to Need for Speed? That does not make sense. So we still need to look into the uh, use cases, uh, scenarios. Mm. I think that sounds pretty fun, actually, facing a <laughs> battleship. But. But, uh, uh, it's been a long discussion yeah, yeah. in the working group. Do we give like the destination platform the freedom or not to interpret yeah. that other way they want? Uh, to your point, I totally agree. Like It should be driven by use cases, and there's multiple layers. And at Sandbox, the first use cases we felt like made the most sense is avatars. Basically, like they are your entry point to the metaverse. So let's bring interoperability through avatars and showcase that anyone who is already owning a digital asset can potentially do much more than just displaying a profile picture or, or mm. an artwork somewhere, but turn it into an avatar that then you can use in sandbox and potentially elsewhere as well. And to date, there's more than 40 of the most popular NFT collections. So we went from the number one and now progressively to onboard a community of thousands of holders of those to engage and play into the metaverse to give this concrete use case. And engagement is tremendous. Like I think retention is twice what people have when they have just their regular traditional non-NFT interoperable avatar, mm. which shows that a metaverse can provide like more additive value for any community in terms of socialization and user-generated content and develop new skills beyond. So use cases, you guys mentioned about use cases, right? So you know, today morning I looked at Statista, uh, the website, and I looked at uh, gaming, right? Half of the world population is playing video games, online you know, video games, right? So it's obvious, you know, metaverse, uh, you know, in gaming industry would be like an early adopter of metaverse. Uh, you know, the trend is there. And then I also checked the top websites, the traffic wise, right? Uh, there were some adult sites. Uh, I don't want to mention the names here, you know, but so you can see basically metaverse early adopters would be like gaming industry and adult entertainment industry would be the early adopters, just like internet happened, right? What other use cases are, uh, are possible? Like, can you guys think of, uh, mention about other use cases? And I do hear about like, you know, working, you know, remote working and all that kind of stuff, uh, education, right? Uh, so let yeah. me hear from you guys, like what other use cases can you envision at this I point? I mean, j just to sort of expand it out a bit on the media and entertainment piece. I mean, there's art exhibitions, there's concerts, there's meetings, et cetera. So there's, there's all sorts of different facets there, I think. And, and putting my forecasting hat on here a bit, I think education is gonna be a big one to allow people to upgrade their skills, go to university in the metaverse. Um, I think professional development is, is definitely a part of that. Um, I also think one less talked about is just you know, potentially people living in certain regimes or um, living in, in areas with economic difficulties where they can't travel. Potentially that's a new use case for them as well to travel. engage yeah. with like-minded people in a more realistic manner. So I think it's, it's only the beginning and it's, it's pretty exciting to wait and see yeah. how this how this Travel goes. I can understand. Before somebody travels, you know, they're on a plane, they could kind of experience yeah. the city and then decide where they want to go, Yeah, yeah. right? We have limited time. You're there like three days or something. So next step. Yeah, exactly. Those examples you just gave, I think just reflect the very fundamental need why we need a metaverse. It's like life is elsewhere, right? So our current life is boring. So in metaverses, we can not have in different Davos. life. <laughs> not in Davos. <laughs> okay. It's but Davos here. is not boring. It's fun. <laughs> okay. But I would like to add, like, uh, I think uh, healthcare definitely is a big thing, especially like uh, we heard of something like a digital therapy, right? 
And also for the event industry, I think Metaverse is going to make uh, uh, disruptive changes very soon. Uh, and the third one I would, I'd like to add would be, um, well, of course, it's like the collaboration, like co-working, people can work together, although they are physically remote to, to each other. Sebastian. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Metaverse will empower all sectors of the industry, like shopping, commerce, education, tourism, culture, art, architecture. So what are the uh, users doing but, right now on Sandbox? But first, uh, I still yeah. focus on entertainment in Sandbox, like music, gaming, and fashion, I think are the three verticals that are the most okay. likely to take off, and I've already shown great promises from what we've seen. Uh, I want to deep dive a little bit about gaming. Like you, like you said, there's about three billion gamers around the world, so it's hard to, s we're just all gamer now, but Not like there is yeah. different category of, oh, you probably play casual game on your mobile phone and don't even think we'll, yourself we'll talk in the gamer evening. <laughs> anymore. Yeah. We'll talk and in the evening. I, I really see the future of gaming around user-generated content, like giving the possibility to anyone to start making their content, their level, expand it, that's what drives more retention, more engagement. And we've seen that the top 10 titles have such kind of feature. And that's where uh, Metaverse and blockchain technology makes even more sense, like yeah. to reward those creators for more fairly. Thank you, Dietrich, we have 20 seconds. So. Hey, I mean, I think to build on that use case, yeah. when people are creating that content and they actually have agency and ownership over that content and it can move around where they go, and how they live their life online, mm. that's really powerful. It's very different from the internet that we have today, and I think that's what makes the metaverse different. So as I said in the beginning, we originally had a policy expert, right? Uh, you, you know, even though we don't have that uh, expert here, uh, it was a female speaker, I still want to ask this question. Have you guys heard of uh, harassment in metaverse? Uh, several articles, uh, you know, about harassment in the metaverse, and uh, so, it's gonna get interesting for policymakers. They're still trying to catch up, like, what, how do we deal with stable coins? They don't know what to do with the rest of them, right? DAO, like, there's so many things happening, and now we're, metaverse, like, how, you know, harassment, and, I mean, of course, we have to educate them, like, uh, what, what are your views on that? Like, I mean, we are tech guys, we don't have a policy expert here, but. So, uh, I think first you have to think, like, what does it mean, harassment? It means, like, we've gone through so the understanding and the acceptance that our digital identity and the, ourself, we can have multiple identities into virtual world and we assimilate those virtual bodies, those avatar characters to our identity, to our very own. And so when someone gets too close to us, we feel like there is this notion of like, you're invading my space mm -hmm. and you're having inappropriate That's why I'm behavior. sitting here, you know? Right, I'm sitting but, but far there away. is already like <laughs> ethical code about like the behaviors of virtual avatar that was written by Raf Koster, which is one of very famous game designer of MMORPGs. That's not something new, but something that because the sheer uh, reach of millions of users already in virtual worlds now makes more sense. There will be political, there will be democracy, governance involved, and we have to protect the right of citizens where they are, wherever they are, even in digital nations. I, I, I think one of the things we've seen this year especially is the failure of centralized and top-down content policy and moderation. Mm. And uh, the, there's a book called Design Justice that talks really about how to let communities, marginalized communities, really define what those interactions and power structures are in their communities. And when they have control in those rules, in defining them for their people that they have consented to share space with, that the incidence of harassment goes down. So I think if there's a pattern that we really wanna look at, it's how can we give those tools to communities to be able to define those things for themselves instead of deciding that we know better. I would just add, you have, that's uh, yeah. exactly what we, we, why, why we, we will need uh, like uh, standards, uh, non-technical standards to address those ethical and uh, societal issues. So uh, we can provide the uh, tools for policymakers to leverage. And there's a lot of work on ethics, AI, and all yeah. of that recently cracked right. in the IEEE. Exactly. So I, I think we are, it's really red. I think we are way over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't we like have a closing comments, a few seconds, each one of you, and uh, we will, We'll let these folks go to the next panel, yeah. Yeah, look, I think from my perspective, the key message is, um, you know, this is still a very new technology. It's gonna continue to evolve over the next few years, but, but not just the next few years, probably over the next couple of decades. 
And um, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna look at a couple of things more closely and, and pay attention, it's probably that mix of open versus closed and how that's gonna intermingle over the next few years. Okay, that's super interesting as well as. I mean, some of these tricky, uh, you know, moral issues and how those those are going to be handled. So, yeah. watch closely. Do you want? I just wanted to mention again that we are establishing a new organization to accelerate the growth of metaverse ecosystem and to make sure it will be sustainable. So the name is IEEE STO Metaverse Acceleration and Sustainability Association. So you can follow me. Well, connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I'd like to say that at the end of the day, we're only a platform. We provide tools for people to be more creative, to empower their creativity. We're uh, working on topics that we feel are important for shaping the future of digital economies. Mm. But what the metaverse will end up is like what you will end up making it. So like I invite you to create an avatar, to go explore what it is right now, what it can become potentially, and contribute into it. And it will shape up as you engage into it. Are they going to send it? Are you going to send tokens? Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think when we think about what the metaverse is and what we want the internet to be and what our lives online to be, we have a unique opportunity now to make bigger asks. We learned a lot from the last 30 years of the internet. Let's make a new one that works better, works the way that we need it to for us. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, the audience. I think that's a close of the panel. Maybe, George, you can take a picture of us.